my pleasure to welcome everybody to APCUG's Wednesday workshops, a period of time where you can get more in-depth information on timely technology topics, TTT. Uh, today, we are going to do a very unique one. I'm very excited to learn more about drones because I don't know. And we have with us today a expert as in terms of flights, uh, Larry Fo uh, Fortney is here and he has over 120 uh, logged drone flights to his record. And I watched his latest one and he's gonna talk to, to us today about all sorts of stuff about drone. And uh, it's gonna be all totally new for me because I don't know a lot about him except I see him once a while. Larry's from Florida. He's the president of the Lakes of Leesburg Computer and Technology Club. And he's also a member of the uh, Lake Sumter uh, Society and Computer Club. So I'm gonna turn things over to Larry and uh, sit back and enjoy while he shares with us. Why, good morning or afternoon, whatever the case may be. I uh, appreciate your having me on here. Today, I'm gonna to be talking to you about autonomous flight using DJI drones. Um, I kind of like to think of my drone as a flying camera uh, that allows me to see the world from a different perspective. And because of my love for computers and flying, um, plus DJI and DroneLink, uh, which we'll talk about extensively. Uh, they have brought me together um, to the best of both worlds. So they put all that into an affordable package that can be shared around the world. Uh, we'll explain what that sharing means a little later on. Um, flying a drone manually takes a certain amount of skill and that comes with practice. Um, but if you're flying a drone autonomously, that takes a different skill. Uh, it's, and it's one that all of you possess because you're all involved with computers. And in my view, it provides a, a safer flying experience. And you will learn all that as we uh, get into that in this presentation. Uh, you'll find that Hollywood Studios are using um, this app that we're going to talk about. Um, and they use it to create the opening scenes in some of their TV series and movies. And probably after you've watched this presentation, you'll start noticing um, how drones are showing up in both the news and the TV episodes that you watch. And... So as I progress through this uh, presentation, uh, please take notes because um, I'm sure you'll have some questions afterwards. And with that, I'm going to share my screen. Okay, so let me get this going again. So I am a, uh, a Mac uh, user. And I'm giving my presentation today with Keynote, which is the Mac version of um, uh, PowerPoint, if you will. And the photo that you're seeing here is of a Mavic Mini drone. Um, and there are two versions out now, uh, Mavic Mini 1. Um, <clears throat> So this is uh, the first slide. I, like I said, this is the, the Mavic Mini 1, which is the drone that I am currently flying. And my first slide says fly responsibly. Um, and if you're flying a drone, you're likely to meet some privacy resistance because there's a lot of Karens out there. And if you know what a Karen is, um, so learn your rights and be prepared before you go out because uh, undoubtedly you're going to run across somebody that doesn't like drones. Um, and you certainly need to understand the local regulations before you fly. Um, 
The main rule that you're going to need to adhere to is to stay below 400 feet here in the U.S. Uh, besides, your photography looks so much better when you're at a lower height. And another big no-no is not to fly over people. And if you're going to use your drone for commercial purposes, that requires you to have a license. And the license is quite uh, difficult to pass uh, and uh, costs about $150 to take the test. But if you're just doing this for a hobby, those restrictions um, do not apply there. <clears throat> now the Mavic Mini has two versions, a one and a two. And I have the version one and there is no registration required for either because they weigh less than 250 grams. But even if you did have to register it, and we're not talking about licensing, we're just talking about registering it, the cost is only $5. And I think that is registering you for three years now. Um, it used to be the $5 bought you five years of registrations. And, uh, but now they've reduced it to three years. If you're doing commercial use, you need the part 107 uh, test. Uh, you have to take that test uh, to uh, become certified to do commercial use. Again, it's uh, 400 feet or 120 meters is the flight limit here in the USA. Um, unfortunately, I see too many videos of people on Facebook and whatever who are flying way, way higher than that. It is dangerous. Um, and the, the fines, if you, uh, if you get caught are extensive, I think, uh, one gentleman has got a fine of $184,000 racked up. Um, and it's dangerous if a, a, a plane should happen to hit your drone. As to the costs, um, Entry-level costs, I started out with a drone called the Tello, and it was all of $99. And by the time you add a little, you know, an extra controller to it, I think I spent $150 on it. And it didn't have, have a very wide range as far as how far it could travel, uh, but it was a starter drone and allows you to learn how to fly it. You can fly it in your house. It has uh, propeller guards on it. And uh, it's a good starter uh, drone. The next one up is the one that I have, which is the Mavic Mini 1, which sells for $399. Um, and you can buy extra batteries, a charger, some prop protection, uh, in what is called the Fly More package, and that adds another $100 to it. The Mavic Mini 2 um, starts at uh, $449, and you can now get flyaway coverage um, in the event that your drone flies away on you. You can get it re replaced for $225. Um, there's a refresh care option that you can purchase for $39 that allows you to send your broken drone in for repair and get a discount on having it repaired or, or replaced. Um, and this flyaway coverage has just been added um, by DJI, um, but you have to go in and apply for it. And I keep trying to use my keyboard and it doesn't want to advance. So we'll go do it this way. Um, so the Fly More package gives you two extra batteries, which if you purchase separately, they would be $55 each. So that extra, that $100 pays for itself uh, just in the charge for the batteries. 
but you also get a battery charger for them. And you get a propeller cage for protection um, if you wanted to fly it in your home uh, or, or even outside for that matter while you're trying to learn how to fly. This is what the Mavic Mini 1 controller looks like. Uh, the controller itself, um, in this particular picture, it also has a smartphone uh, attached to it, which is what you use to view uh, what your drone sees while you're flying. Um, and these two little handles at the bottom there expand out uh, so you can put a bigger um, smartphone in there that has a little bigger footprint. Or you can do as I have done, and I now use a iPad um, mini, and I, I have a 3D printer, so I printed a bracket for it, but you can buy them as well, um, that allows you to mount a bigger device into that holder. And the cable that comes with it uh, that connects your phone to the controller is a short cable. So if you go with a, the iPad mini or something larger, you're going to have to get a longer cable for it. Now the drone itself can dry, fly with or without the smartphone. It doesn't need a smartphone, but if you do not use a smartphone, you're you're flying by line of sight only. Um, and they work on um, 2.4 and 5 gigahertz Wi-Fi frequencies. But surprisingly, they've got a range that can go out to a couple of miles on the Mavic Mini 1 and up to about four miles on the Mavic Mini 2, which essentially violates what you're supposed to be doing with the drone because technically you're supposed to stay within line of sight of your drone. And if you're out two miles, you certainly cannot see it. Um, and flying with first person view, which is what FPV stands for, uh, versus manually flying, uh, that experience is quite different. So when you're flying manually, you are using the um, control sticks and you're watching the drone as it flies. If you're flying first person video, you're watching the drone uh, as to where it is going on your smartphone screen or your iPad screen in my case. And you see what the drone sees as it flies around. And so if you're, you're flying manually and you fly away from yourself, pushing the stick to the right would turn the drone, make it fly to the right. Or if you did the left stick and did it to the right, it would make it yaw to the right. And that's fine when you're flying away from you. But when you turn the drone around and you come back to you, turning the stick to the left turns your drone to the right. So you have to get into the mindset of being in the drone itself if you're gonna fly manually. You have to be thinking all the time as if I'm in that drone in order for my fingers to know which direction takes me the direction I wanna go. And that takes a, a bit of experience um, and practice to get used to doing that so it comes automatically. Now, DJI is the drones that I'm talking about today. There are a lot of other manufacturers out there. Um, DJI has been around for a long time. They make a wide range of, of uh, drones, um, starting from the Mavic Mini 1, which is their bottom of the line drone for $400 going up into the thousands of dollars. And the Mavic Mini comes with an app that you install on your phone that you can use to fly your drone with. And that 
DJI Fly app has three different modes. One's called uh, cinematic, one is called position, and one is sport mode. And position is the one most everyone uses to get into position. And then they may go to cinematic, which slows everything down. So it only it takes a lot of movement on the stick to produce a little movement in the drone. Converse to that, you have sport mode. Sport mode, you better know what you're doing because everything is fast and responsive and you can get out of control in a hurry. Um, because the weight of the Mavic Mini is only 249 grams, uh, it doesn't handle the wind very well. Uh, and so we tend to restrict it to winds that don't go over 20 miles an hour. That's what is suggested. It takes its video uh, in 2.7K, whereas the Mavic Mini 2 shoots video in 4K. Um, they say that the maximum flight speed is 29 miles per hour. Um, I've never actually flown mine in sports mode, so I don't know if I, I've never confirmed that. But the maximum flight time typically runs 25 to 30 minutes. So if you're using the app that DJI uh, asks you to use, uh, you have these three positions at your, uh, three modes at your disposal. And so that position mode again is your default flight mode. Uh, and it gives you access to all the essential functions like uh, your GPS and your obstacle sensors. We'll talk about the obstacle sensors a little later. <coughs> but basically there are two sensors under the bottom of your drone that allow you to allow it to sense how close you are to the ground. Uh, so position mode again allows you to hover in place and it's uh, ideal for taking stable shots. Um, and because your obstacle sensors are active, uh, it will um, if, for example, if you're flying it in your house and you fly it over a sofa, it will rise up above the sofa instead of running into it. So they're helpful from that standpoint. Uh, the sport mode, again, is very fast. Um, and you won't have any access to what are called quick shots, which we'll talk about, uh, when you're operating in sport mode. And... Users tend to use this to get quickly from one place to another, or maybe to get out of trouble if the wind has taken their drone and they're starting to lose control over it. Um, that was would be when you would want to switch to sport mode because it will tilt the drone further and allow you uh, to fly faster. Cinesmooth is the uh, mode that you use for taking video. Uh, and it slows all your stick movements way down and makes it uh, easy to control your drone. So, now I did mention that um, the privacy issues that some people have. Um, so I think one of the advantages to using the Mavic Mini is that it's quiet. Um, so it attracts less attention to the Karens of the world. Um, and the small size of the drone makes it harder to see, but that can be a double-edged sword. So um, thankfully the drone's position relative to you will be visible on the screen of your device. And that will make it easier to identify uh, where to look for your drone if you're trying to get a visual line of sight on it. And so now we get to the part that, uh, that I like the most. This is the 
what I call a, the autonomous flight. And DJI Fly app uh, only has a few limited quick shots and it does not support autonomous flight. And those quick shots consist of a rocket, which uh, you select the rocket mode and your drone rises very fast into the air. And a droney shot is one in which the drone faces you and then it flies out away from you as it goes up into the air. And then of course a circle just does a circle around you. And the helix would do a spiral so that it starts out low and works its way up as it goes in a circle. So those are the quick shots and you can only do those in position mode or semi smooth mode. But if you want to get into autonomous flight, you need a different app for that. And there are a couple of those out there. Uh, one is called Litchi or Litchi. I'm not sure how they pronounce it, but uh, Litchi and DroneLink. And they provide uh, a full rich feature set of flight capabilities, which is going to be the focus of today's presentation specifically drone link. Uh, I do have Leechy. I, I purchased that app and uh, I've, I'm not really fond of it. It is, but it is a app that um, a lot of folks use, um, requires less knowledge to, to use it. Uh, and typically the folks that are flying Leechy, most of those are using uh, Android phones, um, where although they do make the uh, the software for iOS as well, unfortunately the uh, Lychee has not been able to get the uh, Mavic Mini to do waypoints, uh, which DroneLink does and has done from day one. So Leechy is just a $35 app and it stores its commands in the drone itself. And so it executes those commands to perform the autonomous flight that you have specified. Um, but it's, I, unless they've changed it recently, uh, setting up waypoints for the lower priced zone uh, drones, um, has not been uh, supported and I doubt that it will because the recent software development kit that was released uh, for the Mavic Mini uh, doesn't allow them to execute commands within the drone itself. Whereas DroneLink does do that. Um, so the drone, uh, DroneLink app executes your commands as if you were doing that with the joysticks on your controller. So that gives you a big advantage uh, that you can do waypoints. And it used to, when it first came out, I was one of the first uh, users of DroneLink for the Mavic Mini. And at that time it was $20 to purchase it. And they have since uh, gotten a huge following of people with the entry level zones that drones, such as a Mavic Mini. And so they've raised the prices on them and they have a, a three tiered price range of 20, 40 and $80, depending on what features that you want to go with it. And the $40 uh, set is one most everyone uses. Unless you're doing something for commercial use, uh, it is sufficient for everything. Um, and the, the gentleman who did all of the coding for DroneLink let all of us who initially got in for $20 be upgraded to the uh, $80 package. And uh, so we we're able to have access to all of those features. 
Um, so I did mention that uh, drone link exits to commands from the joysticks. And that is going to give you a huge advantage over Litchi. There is another app that is out there, and there'll probably be more in the future since DJI release, released the software development kit for programmers to use to create apps. And HDR Pano 3D is one of those apps that is designed for the serious photographer. I did purchase it and I tried it out and it's way above my pay grade. Uh, I'm not really uh, into photography. Um, I mean, I like to use the drones for photography and for video, but um, not to the level that these folks take it. So if you're a professional photographer, um, you would find this probably quite useful. And I put a link here on my PDF file, which I will provide, uh, uh, I assume that you'll be able to download that later. If not, it's right here, hdrpano.ch slash hdrpano dash app.htm. So pros and cons between Leachy and DroneLink, uh, I've already discussed some of them. Um, Leachy requires uh, less processing power from your, your device, like your smartphone, than does uh, DroneLink. DroneLink is processor intensive because it is generating the commands from your controller or it's generating the commands actually from your smartphone or tablet and sending those to the controller and then the controller is sending those on to your drone. Um, so I find that when I follow the different forums on face and Facebook groups that the people that um, are using Leechy prefer to use the Android devices and they really they don't invest the time and effort that it would take to get the most out of their drone with an application such as DroneLink. DroneLink is, uh, it has a very powerful command set. Um, it needs a high-end device, does require a little more processing power, and it does require the user to spend a lot more time and effort learning to use it because it is very, very, very powerful. It provides uh, access to every command in the software development kit. Uh, you can create your own um, commands with it using JavaScript, if you want to get into it that deeply. But that's not really required. Um, there are a ton of YouTube videos out there, especially from the gentleman who created the software, has a beautiful repository of uh, videos that teach you everything you need to know. Um, but there are a lot of videos to go through to learn everything about it. Um, because Leechy is still in beta, it's unable to do waypoints, at least for the Mavic Mini. But it does do uh, what's called follow modes and orbit mode and pano, focus and track. Um, and I think that's what a lot of folks like about the Leechy app. And DroneLink initially uh, did not have the follow, orbit and uh, focus modes, um, but they do now. Um, that has come out fairly recently. Initially, it came out in beta mode where you could test it uh, as a beta user. And then they released it as a full-blown release. And it has been able to do waypoints from day one. Um, so DroneLink, when it was initially written, was for the high-end drones. I'm talking about the five to $7,000 drones 
um, and they didn't have a lot of users um, using it, but, uh, and the gentleman who wrote all of the coding, uh, his, his name is um, Jim McAndrews, and he is one very smart fellow. Uh, if you watch his um, tutorials that he has on YouTube, and he, you can find those under his name, Drone Link, um, you'll see what uh, what is capable. Now, <clears throat> the Drone Link has some what they call on-the-fly modes. Uh, you don't need to do any programming of your own. You just need to take your drone out manually fly it to a point of interest where you want and pick one of the different 16 different on the fly modes and they can do anything from 360 photo 360 photos cardinal photos circle droney facade map path spiral a trucking shot and now follow me focus and orbit those last three follow me, focus, and orbit, require a device that has a cellular connection to it, a cellular for GPS. Initially, I bought, uh, I started out with an iPhone 6, which is a little underpowered. It could fly it, but um, I decided I need to up my game. And I purchased an iPad mini fifth generation which is three times power, more powerful than the previous generation. And uh, then I discovered that when Follow Me, Focus, and Orbit came out, I couldn't use it because it didn't have the GPS hardware. So I ended up giving that iPad to my wife, and then I bought the cellular version of it. And I've yet to use those functions yet, but my time will come. Eventually, I'll get to it. The cool thing about DroneLink is that you plan your flight on your computer in a web browser like Chrome or uh, Fox, Firefox or Safari or whatever. Um, any web browser. Uh, can be used to plan your flight in advance. And there's a function in that planning called Mission Preview. And that shows everything about your flight, including the times, the distances, how your camera is behaving, the altitudes, and it's all laid out uh, for you to test before you ever take your drone out to fly it. And then um, once you have previewed it on the app itself, you can export that path to Google Earth and then use uh, Google Earth to preview your flight in three dimensions. So you can get an idea of the heights that you're going to encounter during your mission. And Another interesting aspect is mission sharing. Um, you can have um, both private and public missions that you create. If you create your, uh, your mission as a public mission, everyone uh, who has a DroneLink account can look at your mission and see what you did and learn from what you have done or um, you can share your mission with others if you have uh, questions and you want help uh, on how to set your mission up. Or you can create private missions which only you can see. That's strictly up to you. But it's quite helpful if you're trying to get help from others when you don't know exactly how to do something. <clears throat> as far as fake Facebook groups go, there are several which have excellent resources for asking questions and sharing your experience. 
Um, so there are a number of groups. Um, and Litchi does have uh, also, they have Facebook groups. But that is the only support you're going to get for Litchi uh, compared to DroneLink. And I'll talk about that in a moment. So DroneLink has a support forum. And that's another plus uh, in DroneLink's favor. Uh, and in that particular forum, they have a section in which users can submit feature requests. And there is a product roadmap that shows what has been implemented thus far, what is being worked on. And you can kind of follow along as to how they are uh, implementing new features. And if you're brave, you want to try out the beta versions, they're available in an app called Test Flight. You can sign up for that and test the uh, beta versions yourself. This is what the product roadmap website page looks like. Uh, as you can see, they have a lot of different categories. The one on the far right is categories that have been completed. Um, and all the things to the left are things they're working on or people have requested. So I expect this app to grow significantly in the future. It is already grown significantly since I first started using it. Another great feature about DroneLink is the ability to use uh, a website called uh, airdata.com and you can sign up for a free account on Air Data, and you can link that website with DroneLink such that when you complete a mission, it automatically uploads your entire log file to Air Data, and you can then display all of the information that was captured during your drone flights. It will show your altitudes, uh, any errors that were incurred uh, in the transmission of data between the controller and the drone. It will, if you, they give you a free version, but if you purchase it uh, for just a few bucks, um, you can also get in-flight wind conditions that will show you wind direction and wind speeds all throughout your flight. And the log files are automatically uploaded at the completion of the flight, so you don't have to do anything at all. Uh, the free version gives you 100 missions or, or 100 log files for free. If you purchase the, um, the plan, which I think was like five bucks or so, um, you get up to 400 uh, log files that uh, can be kept uh, online at any given time. If you're using the DJI Fly app, uh, you have to manually upload the log files. So again, this is another plus to using DroneLink. So, um, I put a link down in here to a YouTube video about uh, seven ways to avoid the wrath of the FAA. And I, I would highly recommend anyone who's going to get into flying drones to watch this video so that you don't get in trouble with the FAA. Because remember, every detail about your flight is logged and the FAA can get access to that. So in my particular case, I live in an FAA uh, restricted zone area. I live close to an airport. That means that I need to either request permission from the FAA to, to fly 
uh, or I have to adhere to the restricted uh, boundaries that they have set for me. And I will, when we get into the actual online demonstration, um, I will show you what that looks like. Again, I mentioned that Leachy stores its uh, commands that are loaded uh, from your device and stored in your drone where they're executed, whereas DroneLink loads its missions into your device, and then your device sends those commands to the drone. And waypoints, as far as I know, are still not implemented for the entry-level Mavic Mini in Leachy. Um, and they may never be, from what I understand. Uh, drone link, on the other hand, executes commands from your device as if you're sending them from the joysticks. Therefore, you can pause a mission um, and then fly manually, take some photos or some more video, um, do whatever you like, and then uh, resume from where you left off and the drone will go back to the previous uh, waypoint and start flying your, to complete your mission. And I don't know if I talked about in my slides here um, about the return to home feature, which um, is built in. Um, there are some settings you have to set up initially to say what is the return to home altitude that you want your drone to fly to before it starts coming back to you. But because the drone has a GPS built into it, um, if you get into trouble, uh, if you lose the video feed, for example, uh, you can hit the little button on your controller and that will instruct the drone to return to home. It will come right back to where it took off from and land. Um, so that is probably one of the things that everybody gets really concerned about is, oh my gosh, what happens if um, my drone gets out of range um, or something to that effect? And all of that is built in and taken care of. If you lose a uh, connection with your controller uh, or you lose video uh, feeds and all of that, um, your drone, or, or if your battery drops to a certain level, your drone will turn around and fly back to you and land, assuming you have enough battery power. Once you have completed the mission and you have your video or your photos that you've taken, um, that footage, uh, video footage is stored on an SD card that is in your drone. And so when you get your drone back, you pop the SD card out, put it into a SD card reader into your computer and you transfer those files to your computer for post-production editing. In my case, I'm using uh, the Mac, uh, Apple Mac uh, mini computer. And therefore I use a product called Camtasia Studio for doing my post-production. But there are tons of other software out there um, that are not as expensive as this one. A lot of them that are free. And uh, especially if you're a Windows user, you'll find applications that can do that for you. So um, we've arrived at this point in my slides where I'm going to actually take you out and uh, show you the drone link app and give you a demonstration and show you some of the things that I've already been talking about in the previous slides. So I'm going to uh, stop sharing this particular uh, One, and I'm going to instead go over and share my desktop with you.
And let's see, I don't want my Zoom thing up here particularly. All right, let's, uh, let's, let's take you first of all to the uh, drone link, uh, app, not the app that runs on your drone, but the drone link website that you go to um, in uh, your web browser to set up a mission uh, that can be flown in your drone. Um, so you cannot get to this unless you've purchased it. There's no trial version available to try it out. Um, so this will give you at least a preview of what it looks like. Uh, and you will see here that um, I'm logged in here and I have, I can create a new repository, which is a storage place for storing all my different missions. And I have some different missions already, different repositories rather, already established um, that I have created. Um, and within each repository are different missions that I have set up. And these missions can be defined as either public or private and they can be shared with other users as we discussed earlier. Um, so I'm gonna bring up my most recent um, a mission that I have created. It's called uh, the uh, Publix Construction and Mall Area. And this is what a completed mission looks like. Um, I have been doing um, reconnaissance missions, if you will, on a Publix uh, grocery store that is in my neighborhood. And I've been doing not daily flights, but every one or two days, maybe three or four days, depending, um, to monitor the progress from the time they started demolishing the uh, public store to the rebuilding of it. And I've been doing this since uh, September. And I changed the mission around uh, kind of on a, not daily basis, but maybe a maybe a, a weekly basis at least, depending on what work they're doing uh, in the area. This particular uh, area here is uh, an entire shopping complex. It's called the Shops of Lake Village and Publix is in the center of it. And then there are stores that run along the outside. And recently they have started tearing the roofing uh, off of all of the adjacent stores and they're putting up new tile uh, roofing on those stores. So I have altered my mission plan to uh, go take a look at what's going on at Publix and then uh, go around the storefronts to show what is going on and the progress being made there. This is the DroneLink website, uh, it's dronelink.com. And this is where you would go to sign up and purchase a DroneLink app that you can use. Um, again, they support all kinds of hardware from iOS, Android, um, DJI monitors, smart controllers, uh, all of these different uh, platforms and um, you only pay once for them. And we'll get into showing you this a little bit here in a bit uh, about pre-fight uh, visualization. Uh, it's gonna allow you to see every aspect of your flight and experience it on your computer uh, without actually taking your drone out and even turning it on you'll know what is going to happen before you go there. To me, this is a lot safer than me going out and trying to 
manually fly my drone. Um, and I know exactly what to expect. It's a one button press once I get there and the drone does everything autonomously. It's built by drone pilots for drone pilots. And Jim Mc, uh, Allison is the developer of DroneLink and he has been uh, very helpful when I first got into it, uh, answering questions that theoretically or technically he didn't have to because I hadn't purchased the more expensive drone package, but he answered them anyhow. Um, and he does answer the questions on a forum. And we're gonna talk about that next. So this is the support forum for Drone Link. Uh, there are a general discussion area. Uh, there's 571 posts in there. There's a section for feature requests where we have 176 posts. And then there's a place for bug reports for the uh, problems that you might have encountered either in the beta version or in the released version. So <clears throat> again, uh, you know, this is support above and beyond the call of duty in my uh, judgment. I talked about the log files that are stored in your drone. Uh, those log files are automatically uploaded by uh, drone link when your mission completes. And uh, this is what you get to see. Uh, so if this is my last mission that I completed on uh, yesterday and 1.55 in the afternoon, and it shows me uh, the path that my drone took. It tells me the length of time, which was seven minutes and 47 seconds, what my takeoff battery level was and what it was when it landed, uh, what drone I was using, what version of the software I was using, and the total footage uh, that the drone uh, made during that mission. Uh, its maximum distance that it was away from me, the maximum altitude that it attained, and the maximum speed that it attained, um, in addition to weather. So uh, it tells me what the temperature was outside, the, what the wind speed was, the uh, humidity. Um, and I signed up for the purchase, I purchased a subscription so I get in-flight wind uh, specific information um, that will uh, show me uh, what the average wind speed was and the average gust and things like that. Uh, let's go back to home. Let's go back to general, excuse me. Uh, there's a section on sensors. And those sensors uh, show you uh, all of the points of interest throughout the flight as to altitudes, distances from you, any kind of signal errors um, that were encountered during your flight. Um, you can also uh, download uh, what's called a KML file. Um, and you can use that in conjunction with the mission file that you'll create in DroneLink to compare the exact path uh, that the drone flew compared to the path that you created. Um, and we can show you that when we get into the demonstration. Um, trying to get over here to AirMap. So AirMap uh, 
is a website that you can go to to find out uh, whether you are in a restricted zone or not. Um, Again, uh, the Leesburg International Airport is within my, my area that I fly. And if I zoom in on this, um, I can zoom into the area where uh, I typically fly. So I live in this particular complex right here. And this shows me that I can fly up to 400 feet uh, within this particular zone. I have to be very careful because there are gonna be aircraft in the area. And you see here Publix is listed uh, right here. And this is the area that I have been covering. And I am within that 400 foot zone. But if I go just across uh, the way to the mall area over here, I find that I have a, um, I have a more restricted area over here. And I did venture out into that area because there was a carnival set up right in here. Um, and so I did get out as far as about here. Um, in order to take some footage of the carnival that lasted for a few days. And uh, this is one of the Facebook's groups. Uh, this was the Facebook group called uh, Advanced Drone Lake Pilots. And there's a, several out here actually. Um, I belong to about five different Drone Link Facebook groups. And YouTube has the tutorial videos um, that will step you through everything from simple to complex. Everything from your first mission creating it to complex missions. Um, Drone Link is the, is Jim, um, Mc, what's his name? Jim McAllister, Jim McAllison. Jim McAllison. Uh, so uh, these videos uh, show you everything that you would need to know. And if not, there's another gentleman called um, OYIBO.VFX. And he has done tons of uh, tutorial videos. Um, and he is, uh, he is from Belgium. And uh, he has some very interesting uh, plans that he has set up and some interesting videos uh, uh, showing uh, places that he has done videos with his drone. And he has some of the more higher end pricey drones, the uh, DJI Inspire, uh, I think is his one of his favorites. And uh, so, he has a, a lot of uh, video that you can use to learn from. Uh, this particular website uh, has a drone case that I highly recommend because it's 3D printed. Um, I do have a 3D printer, but uh, I purchased this. It was, it was only $35 and I didn't have to worry about designing it. Um, and you can strap this on your belt and um, put your drone in it with the gimbal protector off of it. And it protects the propellers from warping, which is very important um, because the case that comes with the uh, Mavic Mini uh, is very easy to cause damage to your propellers. Um, and the advantage to this is that um, you, can, you simply drop the drone into this case and the propellers automatically fold into place where they're protected. So we're gonna, I'm gonna go back to the um, 
drone link app on my web browser and uh, we'll close this one out <laughs> and I'm going to create a new plan so that you can see uh, the steps that we go through. So if I click on a new plan, it gives me this little thing that I can drag around and drop wherever I want it. And I'm just going to, I'm going to drop this over here by um, another store uh, that is in my neighborhood, it's Home Depot. And I'm just going to create that uh, plan right here. And I'll, I'll call this one uh, Home Depot Test Plan. And I could give it a description if I wanted. And so one of the first things it's going to want to know uh, about my plan is what is my takeoff restriction? Uh, do I want to restrict my takeoff to a specific area or just no restriction at all? And the second part is what do I do when the mission completes? I can do nothing, just let it stop where it left off or I can have it return to home, which is default, or I can tell it to auto land. So those are the, the choices that I would pick um, for that. And then I have limits that I can set up. By default, um, the speed is set to 10 mile per hour. Um, and my descent rate is 10 uh, feet per second. And my ascent rate is 10 feet per second. And the rotation rate is 45 degrees per second, which is like almost instant. Uh, I typically change that to something slower, like six degrees uh, per second. Uh, and then I also have uh, the horizontal uh, and vertical acceleration and deceleration um, feet per second and rotation deceleration and acceleration. So all of these things are parameters that I can set up in addition to the tolerance. So if I want to restrict my mission to a tighter tolerance such as uh, no further than 10 feet in case the wind blows me off course. Uh, it could cause me to stop the mission uh, if I uh, got too far off course. Or I could restrict my altitude to say something like, uh, uh, like five feet, for example. And once I have set up all my initial plans, I can then go on and select from all of these different capabilities. So I can include a, a component from an existing repository. Uh, that repository could be one of my own that I've already created, or it could be one from a public repository that someone else has created. Or if I have copied something to the clipboard from a previous uh, uh, flight, uh, I could paste that from the clipboard. Uh, or I could set up a destination to somewhere where I want to start flying from. Or I could set up an orbit around a particular point of interest. Or I could set up a path along a uh, a series of waypoints. And if I'm doing mapping, uh, there's a feature there called map uh, where I can create a, a map function where it will crisscross across a, uh, a, an area of land uh, mass and, and take a video uh, in a crisscross pattern. And I also can do a facade in which I fly up and down across a, 
the front of a building, for example. So I'm going to start out here just by doing a, a destination. Um, and here is my, my map. I can put a, a pin to wherever I want to start my destination. Uh, and I'll just put it out here in the parking lot. And so as soon as I click on it, it tells me what my uh, latitude and longitude is. And I have a the altitude I want to fly to. And in this case, I'm just going to say I'm going to fly to 60 feet. And my reference is going to be from my takeoff location. Or I can do ground level or mean sea level. Uh, here in Florida, where I'm located, uh, the ground level is pretty, pretty level. Uh, if I were in a mountainous region, uh, I would want to select ground level because if I tend to take a destination that I'm flying to and the ground level, you know, there's a hill there, uh, I would want the drone to stay above the ground by the amount of feet that I specified and not run into the hill. But because I'm in Florida, I'll just keep it at the takeoff location. Um, again, I have a range that I can specify that if it goes above or below the specified footage, uh, I would get a mission failure, which would allow me to take control manually and uh, get out of the, the trouble that I might be have gotten myself into. In addition to all of that, I can add different, uh, I can add different things like a drone heading. So I might want to have a heading of 120 degrees north. Or I could have a heading that is along a path. Uh, but I don't have a path currently, so I'm just going to do north. And once I reach uh, my altitude, which I've set for 60 feet, uh, I can set up a gimbal orientation so that um, I don't necessarily want the gimbal looking straight ahead. I want to look down at what's underneath me. So I might select like minus 30 degrees off of the horizon, or I could select it off of the path, but I don't have a path yet. So I'll select horizon, and then I can say finish. So what that does is it creates this little uh, thing right here. And it says, okay, I am going to start where this car is parked. Obviously this car was taken uh, there when the, when the map was created by Google Earth. It may not be there now. So I might want to move this around to a different location. So I simply left click on it and drag it to where I want. And you see there's a little circle around it. That means that if I had specified a specific takeoff area, the drone would not take off unless I am within that circle perimeter of this, uh, of this section here. So once I've got that component in place, I could create another co a component, a new component, for example. Um, what I usually do is uh, the first components I create are usually a something from my repository, which sets up a pre-flight list of commands to execute before uh, I start out and also to set up my video and photo settings. Um, I'm not going to do that right now. Um, I'm just, I want to show off something else. So I want to set up a path next. And so I'm going to, I'm going to zoom out a bit here because I want to create a path. And the path is a path from point A to point B. 
and I can move the path around. Um, oh, we'll leave our destination where it is. So let's put a path um, around the back of the Home Depot store. And I'll take my approach and I'll say, we're gonna start by flying over to here at an altitude of 60 feet. Now, it looks like there may be some trees out there. So maybe I want to be safe and I'll just set my altitude to, a, to 100 feet. And the path, it can be set up to be curved, which you see here, or it could be set up to be straight, in which case it would be like this. So maybe I'll leave it straight. <clears throat> I can have my corner radius to be set to, to by default to 20 feet. And I can add points of interest. So if I want my camera to be focused on uh, something at the uh, within the Home Depot, maybe a I want a point of interest in the middle of the store. I can, I can add a point of interest. And so I can say, okay, this is my point of interest. Um, and I'm gonna set the, uh, if I go and click on the point of interest itself, I can select how high uh, is my altitude offset. So the top of, the Home Depot store could be, say, 20 feet high. Um, just roughing a guess in there. So I might want my camera to focus uh, not to ground level, but to 20 feet high. And if I wanted to add an additional waypoint, I could go out here and click on the plus and uh, and add a an additional waypoint like this. And again, I can move them around. And that looks pretty good. I might want to add one more waypoint and have that waypoint come back to where I took off from. And when I get to that waypoint, I might want, if I click on that, um, oh, I guess that's it. I would have to do a, a destination to have it land. So let's just take a quick look at what we've got so far. So over here is a mission preview. And if I go to mission preview, it's gonna create a preview in my web browser in two dimensions. And it will show me uh, the little blue line over here. It shows me the altitudes that I'm at. <clears throat> but if I go down here along this timeline along the bottom, um, I can see uh, different components like uh, the altitudes, for example. So at this point, I'm at 60 feet. At this point over here, I'm at 100 feet. And I can observe that throughout the entire timeline from beginning to end.
Now I have not inserted any camera commands. So if I executed this particular mission, it would not take any video or any photos. It would just simply fly that particular path. Now I'm going to have to move something out of the way so I can get to it. Uh, let's get you. Come on. Come on. Uh, maybe I can minimize. Here we go. So over here is uh, is what my flight looks like. And again, as I as I move along, or I can I can hit the play button here and see how it executes in real time, or I can speed it up, um, or I can go four times speed, and I can observe uh, what the drone is doing in two dimensions. And over here on the left, you see the drone flying. It shows you the direction that it's pointing. So when it reached this particular area here, the drone turns and now it's at 100 feet and it's flying along the path, heading up to this waypoint alpha, at which point it will turn. And it is slowly turning around to get lined up with the waypoint Bravo. And once it reaches that point, it is now headed down to Waypoint Charlie. And then it's going to turn again. And what you see out ahead uh, in this area is what the camera sees. So depending on what my gimbal angle is, that's what the camera would see. Now, if I export this mission to Google Earth by clicking on this icon here, <clears throat> I can save it to my uh, desktop as a plan. I'll stop that here. And then I can open that plan that I just saved in Google Earth. And so Google Earth will come up and the temporary places down here can, you can expand that and go to your flight path. And you can see what it's going to look like um, in three dimensions. And then if I go ahead and click on play, we'll see what it does in real time. So that is uh, just a, a real brief um, description showing you how the a plan can be um, created from scratch um, and then viewed in Google Earth. And then you can go back and go into your mission here. Um, let's see, I want to, uh, let's see, I want to close that out. And then I can, you know, I can tweak this and do different things with it. If I right click, uh, I can select different things like um, a simulated drone, for example. And a simulated drone, um, let's see if I can get this out here, I don't know where the simulated drone is. <clears throat> if 
Well, that wasn't exactly what I wanted. Um, let's hide that for a minute. Well, I'm not seeing it. I guess this is my simulated drone. So if we move this out, we see a dotted line. And way out here is a, uh, a little dot. This shows you your default camera. Uh, what I want to do is click on that and drag it. and get it closer like over here, for example. Now that simulated drone should have shown me what my uh, what my pitch is. So I know that uh, my pitch is minus 31 degrees if I have the camera focused like this and I'm 100 foot in altitude. So if I change this to, uh, to minus 90, then my drone would be looking straight down or if I set it to minus 45, um, it would be looking a little further away. Or if I went to minus 60, further away. Or f <laughs> I don't want to go 60, I want to go to minus 20. And then I would go further away. So you can get an idea of what your drone is looking at with the, what the camera is seeing. So that you can figure out what values to put in here. Let's get out of here. <clears throat> so I'm gonna close this plan out. And I'm gonna go back to my original plan to show you a little bit about a plan that is fully functional. It's got everything in it. So I mentioned that I usually do a pre-flight um, set of components and I set up my maximum drone altitude. So I should never go above 300 feet. I should never uh, be allowed to go more than 6,000 feet. And if I go into my mission estimate, it will tell me that the total distance of this plan is 3,581 feet. So by selecting 6,000 feet, I'm well within the margin. Uh, I found out what this was all about uh, by accident when I had this set to 4,000 feet and I did a plan that was 4,200 feet in total distance. And when I got to 4,000 feet, my mission aborted and flew back home. So uh, then I understood well what this, what this value means. I can set up my warning so that if the battery goes down uh, too low, I'll get a warning beep on my controller and my device. And then I can set up my return to home altitude. So if I press the button on my controller, the drone will rise to a hundred feet and then aim itself to me, to where I'm standing. And that will fly back to where, actually where I took off uh, initially. As soon as you rise off of the ground, the software records your home position so that if you get into trouble, 
your return to home button will always take you right back to where you started from. And then I usually do a, a, a list of commands from my video setup. The first thing I want to do is set up a stop capture, set my camera mode to video, and my uh, NTSC for my video standard, and M MP4 files for my file format. And these are components that are already set up in my repository, and I can place them in any new plan that I start out. Because I did a stop capture, um, one of the first things I want to do is do a camera start capture. And then uh, if we were to preview this particular mission uh, and see what it looks like, we will get a, an idea of what the camera uh, commands are doing. So I know that this mission is seven minutes and 25 seconds long. And if I scroll down, I see that my camera started capturing video right here uh, within just a, a few seconds. And if I, if I play my uh, mission back uh, and then pause right there, I see within two seconds I'm starting my video capture and it will continue until I land over here. If I drop down here, uh, I can see what my altitudes are, uh, both from when I first start the mission. And right now I'm at nine feet off of the ground. If I continue that, I'm at 13, 14, 17, 19. As you see, I'm going up in altitude until I reach 60 feet. And you see that little dot over here is showing you uh, what my camera is seeing, that the gimbal is actually uh, looking straight ahead and it's gonna be focused on the, the public's uh, storefront out here. And now uh, we're starting to make a turn to go to another waypoint. That waypoint will be um, the this uh, A waypoint. And then from there, it's going to go ahead and go to the B waypoint. We'll speed it up a little bit. And we'll go up to four times speed. And so now we see what the drone is, is heading uh, and what the camera is seeing uh, by watching that little red dot. Once it reaches this point, uh, it's going to change the gimbal angle so that I can see the tops of the storefronts along here. And then it's going to make a curve around the front of the storefronts. And I'm not going to take up the full seven minutes, you should get the idea of what it looks like in your mission. Stop that. We'll get out of the motion, out of the preview. <clears throat> so I now have a, a counterclockwise path that is set up and it has five points of interest in it. Those are the ones that are marked like A, B, C, and D. I have a, um, um, so they're marked uh, Alpha, Bravo, Charlie, Delta, Echo. And I also have waypoints set up. They're also marked Alpha, Bravo. And I have markers. And markers are uh, the ones that have numbers in it. So if I'm at marker number three, um, 
what I have done here when I reach that marker is I have changed my speed from whatever it was at marker number two, which was the default, which would have been 10 miles per hour. So when I get to marker three, I'm going to slow it down to two miles per hour. And the reason for that is I want to swing the camera over from looking at this side of the store to looking at this side. And if I'm traversing at 10 miles per hour, um, my camera is not going to get to the center of the store until somewhere back over here. So I need to slow things down. And in this particular case, I've told the camera to go to turn the drone to 270 degrees along the path that it is flying, not along north or south, but along the path. And currently, uh, at this particular point in time, the drone is probably uh, would be facing something like uh, 100, and 100 degrees, somewhere in that vicinity. Um, so I need to get it turned around. And then I want at number, uh, marker number four is, is a, a waypoint uh, that is going to uh, point to uh, this area over in here. Let's go back. So we use markers to uh, change altitude, change speed, change gimbal settings uh, throughout the entire flight. So you can see that I have, uh, I have a marker here that is going to a point of interest. So the point of interest is the point of interest that's labeled Charlie which is over here. And that's represented by a dashed line pointing to Charlie. And I've set up Charlie to be uh, 18 feet above the ground uh, where the wall of the store is. And the longitude and latitude is, is depicted by this point right here. So all of those markers can either change directions or uh, points of interest along the path, or they can change speed, they can change altitude, and they allow us to control the flow of the path. At one point, um, so I have two paths in here. This is the initial path that takes me up to here. And at one point, I had a, uh, an orbit where it did a 360 degree orbit uh, and took video of the storefront of the top of the store, if you will. Um, and when this, when this store was first being built, built before they put up the, the steel structure for the roof, I actually dropped down to 30 feet and I took video from the inside of where the store was being built up. Uh, now that they have the roof in place, I have to stay above it. So that I've taken out the, the uh, orbit that was in between the counterclockwise path and the tour of the boulevard on the way home. And then once it completes all of that path, um, uh, it's going to go out here and fly and take pictures along of the storefront and then fly back to where I started. Once I reach my home, I'm setting my altitude to eight feet. And so the drone will fly down to eight feet and tell me that the mission is complete. And at that point, I will go ahead and land it. I set it to be eight feet in case somebody drives up in their car. I don't want it to go ahead and land on top of somebody.
so this is just one example of um, of a of different uh, the different uh, paths or missions that I have set up. Um, I have one here who's this is uh, the Waksberg uh, repository, and Ron Waksberg is on our uh, uh, presentation with us. Uh, this was a uh, a path across the top of his roof to do a roof inspection. And then I have another one over here, uh, Lone Oak Cemetery, for example. Um, and this uh, this particular path was the one that was four thousand. Oh, I think it was four thousand one hundred and twenty feet or so. Let's see what that says. Four thousand six hundred and thirty six feet. And I had my mission set to four thousand feet. And when it got to about number F waypoint, it says I'm done. Uh, you've reached the limits of your mission and it told, went returned to home. There are other things that you can add in your mission, such as uh, restriction zones. Uh, they can be a polygon that describes an area and a height uh, around maybe a, a group of trees that you do not want to run into during takeoff and landing and it will avoid that area by flying around it or over it. Um, so those are some of the other things that you can do uh, with your plans. And you also have access to public repositories as well as your private repositories. And so there are tons of uh, missions that have uh, you can go to, for example, to explore uh, movies and TV shows. Uh, this one's kind of interesting to see how Downton Abbey was filmed, for example. Um, and this was their mission that they used to create the opening shots for the movie Downton Abbey. And some of these you can just set up to see what it would look like and then go play them back in Google Earth. All right, so I've taken up uh, way too much time. Uh, I need to leave some time for questions. And I think this is a good point to do that. Um, so I'm gonna stop screen sharing and turn this over to you folks to ask your questions. That was great, Larry. It's just uh, not a simple push the button forward and backwards and uh, very, very interesting on pre-planning. Uh, Judy, do you want to start with questions you might have? I have only two questions. Uh, does DroneLink replace the standard software that comes with the DJI Mini, or can you run both alternating between the two? You can run both, not at the same time. Um, typically, you're going to use DJI Fly to set up your uh, maximum heights and return to home uh, values, your calibrate, your compass, um, and uh, do some of those types of things. Um, I think I may have not gotten to them. I think maybe in my uh, in my presentation uh, file, I, I had some screenshots of that. Um, but uh, you can use both apps or all three. You can switch between them. Uh, with drone link, you can pause your mission. Uh, and once you, once you start out and created your mission and you get to your site where you're going to fly, you press one button and it flies the entire flight from start to stop. And you watch it through the camera. You 
you get visual presentations of it in the app itself. Um, and I have a, a number of YouTube videos. Uh, like I said, I've been doing the public's presentations. There's probably, I don't know how, 120 or so of those out there. Some of them I actually, uh, I do the video and I show you what the drone sees. And then at the completion of that video, I show you what I see through the interface of the drone link uh, and what I see on my iPad mini or what you would see if you were using your uh, smartphone. Um, and you get to see the altitudes, uh, the distances, um, everything just the way I see it when I when the drone is flying it. And because I can pause the mission, uh, I could get to a certain point if I saw some interesting activity going on where I wanted to manually take control and go uh, take a video of some workers doing some, some work in a specific area that I wasn't aware that they were gonna be there. Uh, I could do that and then just press the button again and resume from where I left off and complete the mission, assuming I've got enough battery power. Is Larry, there I think... any way to restrict maximum altitude to 400 feet? Yes, absolutely. And I have restricted mine to 300 feet. Uh, and the furthest, uh, the highest I have flown because I am in a restricted area uh, is 150 feet. And I only did that with great caution um, because I, I still was in a 400 foot limit, but I have witnessed uh, you know, helicopters and planes flying pretty low in the area. Although there's a water tower right around the corner from me that is 220 feet high. Uh, so I feel pretty safe that no one's gonna be flying in this area um, the water tower is directly behind Publix, and I have done some drone video where I've done a, uh, gone up to 150 feet and then circled the water tower um, to get video of that. The one thing that uh, scares me the most is birds. Uh, the birds uh, come out and uh, they have been known to attack drones. Um, so... I'm always keeping an eye out uh, for them. One day I got surprised and a whole flock came out from a, a different neighborhood and they converged right when I was in the middle of my Publix uh, top, at the top of it, doing a, uh, uh, an orbit. And I could see the drones. Uh, in fact, the, the video when it completed, I've got two drones that looked like they were within two or three feet in front of the drone that flew in front of it while I was flying. So that is unnerving when you see that. Uh, the rest of it though is pretty straightforward. Um, I do read about people crashing their drones. Uh, I, I think if you're, if you're using drone link and you're setting up your mission and previewing it uh, in Google Earth, you shouldn't be, uh, you shouldn't experience too many problems. It's, um, it, it's pretty cut and dry what it's gonna do. You just need to make sure you're ready for it if something goes wrong. Okay. The, uh, does this drone recognize trees, telephone poles, well, wires, et cetera, and avoid them automatically? No, the entry level drone does not have obstacle avoidance. Uh, you only get into that with the higher priced drones. Um, and probably the best one of those is not a DJI drone, but rather it's a Skydio drone that can uh, fly between trees in a forest while you're riding along on a, a bicycle or something like that. Um, but it is, a, it's, not a cheap drone. It is uh, a more pricey drone. I have a question for those of you who are new to APCUG VTCs and workshops. 
we always uh, send out the, the PDF of the presentation as well as the link to the YouTube when it gets up there. And there are a few uh, links to various and sundry drone things that people have done, and those will also be included. Yeah. And if it's OK with Larry, I'll go ahead and uh, include that link you sent me Monday about the next to the last um, path you did so that they can see that two part, the drone and the controls. My okay. last question in the chat. I have two last questions in the chat box and then we're going to go over to live with a part one zero seven license. Can you fly over people? No, you're not allowed to fly over people. Um, I don't believe you're allowed to do that with the Part 107 either. Um, there, I'm sure people do it, um, but that is that's supposed to be a no-no. Yeah, I believe I believe you can't fly over people. Period. So there's a law that states yep. that. Does yep. Drone Link make your information public? Only if you want to make it public. Uh, you, you can make your uh, mission public um, or you can keep it private. You can share your mission with others. Uh, as I mentioned, I did a, uh, a mission of a, a friend of mine who's on our presentation today of his home doing a roof inspection. I don't know that he's flowing it, uh, he does, he purchased a Mavic Mini like mine, um, but I am able to share that mission with him and he can fly that uh, with his own drone or make changes to it. I have a comment. Uh, being in Southern California and coming from El Segundo, which is just south of LAX, Every once in a while, we get the news as the drones are buzzing the airplanes as they are taking off and landing at LAX. And of course, I'm sure it does at other place, but you know, good old, you know, California people, we don't pay too, too much attention to anything. And uh, one last question. Oh, two. Okay, then stop putting them in the chat box. Uh, isn't this mission over a public small parking lot by definition going to be considered over people? No, I do not actually fly over the people. Um, at least, uh, you know, I see the workers out there and I do not fly over the workers. I'm actually flying off to the side of them and the camera is seeing them. But uh, unless they happen to be right in the, in the path directly under me, um, and I've never yet encountered anyone in that situation. Um, I did come close once uh, in which I, need, I, I used a mission plan that I had altered. And it was a mission plan created before the roof was put into place. And the altitude was set to 35 feet. And... Uh, so when I got to that point, the drone lowered itself to 35 feet and the sensors under the drone detected that there was an object there and it kept me from crashing into the roof of the drone. Um, and then, but again, you know, I was observing it. I had my finger on the uh, pause button that I could have aborted it if I really needed to. And I would abort it if I saw a person that were in the way. Okay, I, I, upgrading from the mini to the mid price to include the obstacle avoidance? The, uh, no, the, the, the mini two was another hundred dollars more, still does not have uh, avoidance technology in it but it has a, a, long, a longer range of Wi-Fi, a little bit longer battery life, um, but it does not uh, have obstacle avoidance. You've got to get up into the thousand, you know, $1,500 range to get uh, obstacle avoidance. Okay, over to Don. 
Well, don't I question. get a turn? Don't I get a turn being oh, a host? Oh, I'm sorry. Have you got your hand raised? Can I have the whole turn? control of everything. Oh, yeah. and, I want, and I want to turn. <laughs> Uh, I wanted to ask. I wanted to ask that uh, since we were watching mostly the one where you had all the waypoints, what about the people who use the Litchi ones that doesn't have waypoints for pre-planning? They have a very limited amount of things that they can do with it. Um, they have. I think what a lot of them use it for is follow me and tracking. Uh, so they can get on a bicycle or a motorcycle or a car and it can track you. But it doesn't do as good a job of tracking as the drone link does because the drone link, uh, because Litchi stores the commands in the drone rather than um, in the controller. With drone link's implementation of that, uh, drone link is tracking the controller, which is in your possession. And it's using the GPS in the controller, as well as the GPS in the drone to resolve the differences. And while it is flying in that mode, you can adjust the height and the distance away from your controller while you are in motion. Um, and you cannot do that with Litchi. Okay. Now, Bill. Don, Don has this digital, <laughs> Bill James, digital hand raised. I can't Go ahead, do Don. You're on. Yes, you can. I'm a co-host. I can't do it. Trust me. <laughs> Don, you're on. Not yet. Oh, you, okay. Uh, would you unmute everybody? I will allow them to unmute themselves. Okay, That's Don, their... will you please unmute yourself? Thank you. Hi, Don Van Sickle, Sterling Heights Computer Club. Uh, did I understand you to say that there's a couple of sensors in the bottom of the drone that allow it to monitor its height above the ground? That is correct. There are two sensors. Uh, with the Flymore package, if you buy that extra, it comes with a set of propeller protectors that you can attach to your drone. Now that does take it above the recommended weight, uh, but you could fly it in your house, for example, and those two sensors would detect furniture. For example, if you started out in one part of your house and you approached a, uh, a couch or a tear or something of that effect, it would raise up above the sofa, chair, or whatever it might encounter so that it would not crash into it. It's also used uh, for over the ground, uh, above ground sensing. So if you're flying from point A to point B and you started out point A is at the bottom of a hill and point B is at the top of a hill, those sensors will keep you from crashing into the hill as it goes from point A to point B, provided you've specified uh, to use that setting. So does that mean that as you're flying one of, um, if you chart a path and you're flying it and it encounters, let's say, a tractor trail or park someplace, it'll bump up above that and then back down. Yes. To maintain the same altitude. Yes. Uh, Bill James, you're on. Hi, Larry. Um, thanks. Um, great presentation. Thank you. Um, I have the uh, exact same uh, drone, which I've never flown. But my question is regarding I'm a Windows user and I noticed that link. Uh, seems to be for Mac uh, and uh, Android users only? No, 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 no. Uh, <clears throat> Mac, Mac uh, iOS, Android, Windows, because the planning is done on your computer, doesn't matter whether you're on uh, Windows or Mac. Uh, okay. it's, a web, it's in a web browser. All right, that was my question. And so... Google Earth is available for the Mac. It's available for Windows. Um, and then as far as the device that you've actually used to fly the drone with, that can be Android or it can be iOS uh, devices. Um, you can freely mix and match them however you like. Larry, so I'd also, 
top on that, that since you said it's browser based, then that would also mean that Linux people could uh, probably access and plan on the browser that way. Yeah, I went on the um, DrumLink um, website and that's where I got really kind of confused. I, I couldn't see where I could download it for Windows. But I must admit something. Well, again, since it's done in the browser, you're going to set up your mission and in, in, I use Google Chrome, but I could, use, I could use Safari or I could use Firefox. It, I, I think they, they work equally well in all of the different browsers. Um, the so, DrumLink software, do I download that to the um, my phone? Yes, the app for the uh, actual flying of the of the mission that you created is an app that you install uh, on either your uh, iPhone or iPad or your Android mm -hmm. device. Okay. And Thank Bill, you. you're going to have to go out and buy an iPad mini now like Larry has. What can I tell you? <laughs> Anyway, I have two things. I thank you to everybody who put their first and last names and uh, the name of your computer club. I really appreciate that because some of you I have been dealing with for 16,000 years and it's fun to place names, but then it's even more fun to place names with groups. And there are six people who are not going to be receiving anything from today's workshop. They have their phone number, they only have a first name, they have gobbledygook or whatever. And I can't match them up with the registration form. And over to Mark, he's got a question. Unmute yourself, please. I, I did notice that air map was interesting that it showed the AMA fields, you know, the clubs on the map as well. So I thought that was interesting. The other comment that I had is that um, there is a remote ID coming out soon in the next couple of years that I don't believe you've talked about. Um, and 107 will be allowing you to fly over people and fly at night as well coming soon for part 107. Thank you. Uh, Edward from Huntsville. <clears throat> yeah, I, I noticed that you take off from parking lots I guess you have to make sure that nobody uh, parks in that spot where it takes off. Otherwise, you got a problem, right? Sorry, you're muted. Uh, yes, that does happen. Uh, several times I have set up my mission at home. I have driven over to Publix and expecting to take off from a location and there's a car sitting there. The fact that it is browser based means that I can very easily change my takeoff location right in my web browser, assuming I have internet connectivity. Um, and I, I can uh, use my iPhone uh, to tether it to get internet connectivity to load the maps in on my browser and make a quick change to it and then load the, the app up and it will get the latest version. Um, but I should make a, a caveat uh, here about, I have the cellular version of my iPad. Um, I don't have a SIM card installed in it. Uh, I don't need a SIM card, but I need the hardware to be able to get the GPS location data if I'm going to use one of the three functions such as focus, follow, um, and orbit, which were recently introduced to DroneLink. But if I'm not gonna use any of those three functions, I don't need the cellular capability of the GPS function, but it will show up on my uh, display that I am maybe 100 or 200 feet uh, away from where I'm actually at um, as far as the, the little icon that shows up uh, showing where you're at and where your drone is located. The problem I was, uh, was wondering about is after it takes off, you have to make sure that nobody parks in the place where the drone takes off. <laughs> Otherwise you got uh, a problem. 
That is correct. And I have one of these fold out uh, Healy pads that uh, I take with me. And I place it on the parking space where I'm going to take off and land. And that way, uh, hopefully nobody's going to drive over and park on top of my Healy pad. But um, even if they did, I set my, my landing destination to be eight to 10 feet above ground for my takeoff point. Just in the event that something comes up, um, it's going to hover 10 feet above the ground while I manually take control and move it to some place that's safe. Over to you. Yes, uh, good presentation. Thank you for all that information. That was really nice. Um, when I saw your last um, view of your plan and we were looking at it from the right side, it looked like the ending point was actually overshooting your landing point. And it could have just been the way I was looking at it. Does, when, when it lands, is it usually within yards, feet, or inches of where you told it to uh, return to? Home, return to Typically two or three feet. And what you might have noticed, or might have seen, is that um, I set a point of interest um, away from me. That wasn't actually where it was going to land, but that's where the camera was looking. It was actually going to land on top of the uh, helipad that I have set out, uh, but the camera is going to be looking straight forward a bit to another area. Are the mark? Thank you. Are the mark? Do the markers also allow you to control the camera setting so that you can change what direction the camera's in and uh, its uh, vertical elevation? I guess you call it, or the the angle. Yes, you control the gimbal angle uh, as well as the reference of the. Uh, degrees along the path, for example. Um, so a lot of times I use 270 degrees along the path, which is uh, facing to my left as a drone flies forward. Um, if I set it to 90 degrees along path, it will face to the right of my drone. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm typically I'm doing counterclockwise paths, which means I'll use the 270 degree along path method. Mm -hmm. um, I did have, a, I did uh, do one mission where they had a, a carnival set up in the mall next door. And I forgot to set my altitude. I set my altitude what I do for Publix, which is 60 feet, which has plenty of clearance. Um, but I set up a path to go look at the, the carnival that was being set up. And when I got done and I reviewed the footage, I went over the Ferris wheel. Mm -hmm. And the Ferris wheel was probably real close, <laughs> um, closer than I wanted it to be. Um, but the camera kind of makes things look closer than they really are. So I was probably quite safe, but um, I redid that mission to go up to 80 feet before I did it again. <laughs> So to stay away from people, when you're looking at a festival, do you just keep your path around the perimeter of where all the people are? Correct. Oh, I see. Okay, thanks. Larry, I got a message that came to me for you that uh, Ron said he did fly the course that you created for uh, his house. He said it was scary, very scary the first time, but getting better now. <laughs> yes, I, I think that is... Uh... The experience that we all uh, have when we first do it uh, until we get comfortable with it uh, and realize that it is going to do exactly what we told it. If we told it what to do, it will do uh, what we told it. If we don't take into account everything and preview it, um, that's when we get the surprise, which uh, again, I I was unable to preview that particular carnival shot because all I see in the preview was a parking lot and there was no uh, Ferris wheel there. And so I didn't have a, a, a guide to tell me how high it was. Um, 
although in hindsight, I should have probably driven over there and taken the drone up to see what my clearances were. Um, so that was kind of a, a, a scary situation. I did uh, also, I did the Tello drone, which I told, I mentioned was a, a very entry level drone for like a hundred dollars. Um, and it had a follow me mode on it. And I used that mode to follow me from the entrance of our subdivision to my home. And surprisingly, um, it did follow me. Uh, it wasn't, it doesn't have GPS, but it kept me in a line of sight visually with a camera. And if I would speed up, uh, the drone would lower. If I would slow, or I'm sorry, if I would speed up, the, the drone would go higher to stay in focus. If I slowed down, it would drop in altitude. And so I took my golf cart and I drove from the entrance to all the way to my home, avoiding trees, stop signs, and the like. And just as I got to my home, there was a lady and her dog walking it, and I had a car behind me. And if I was to stop, the drone was going to come down on top of the car. If I was to go forward, I could possibly uh, have problems with the lady walking her dog. Uh, but fortunately, the dog had to pee <laughs> just in the nick of time. <laughs> and, I, and I was able to complete that flight uh, without problem. Uh, question for you about the accuracy of the GPS. For example, you know, how many feet does it stay close to a path? Of, like if you're using a, uh, uh, like a walking path, maybe. Very, very, very close. Um, in fact, the, uh, you can create your, uh, your path, your mission, and save your mission file, view it in Google Earth, and after you've flown that particular mission, you can open uh, air, um, air data and export your actual mission uh, as air data saw it from the drone and export that to a KML file and open it in with Google Earth at the same time. And you can see the difference between the actual mission path and what the actual drone flew. And it is extremely uh, close, very, 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 very accurate. But again, it depends on how many satellites uh, you have. Uh, there's another factor that comes into place. It's called KP. I don't know what KP stands for, but it has to do with sunspot activity. And if the KP activity is above four, um, you're advised not to fly your drone. And so there is an app I have installed on my, my iPad and on my, uh, my iPhone, uh, which allows me to uh, see what the weather conditions are. And it tells me what the KP index is, as well as what the expected straight winds and the gusts are set to be, uh, along with temperatures and things like that. <clears throat> so I find that uh, I, I always reference that before I go out um, to see if I'm within the limits of uh, what I should be maintaining. Back to Kevin. Got another question. Yeah, Larry, um, one of the things that came up for me is uh, where would I go to find the, uh, I'm in Lake County, Florida. So the local, state and federal regulations um, my wife gave me a little drone for Christmas a, a, a year and a month ago, and um, I haven't even really put batteries in it yet. And um, I just want to make sure I know what I'm doing before I go out there. Um, I haven't really gone too many places with, uh, I kind of stay within my own territory here. <clears throat> so I haven't had a need to go look up the local zoning restrictions. Um, if I wanted to go to Mount Dora or something like that, I would probably go to their city website and see if their 
any drone restrictions there. Um, but because I tend to, to fly right here within my own community, um, I, I just go by the regulations that apply to the airport because I am in a restricted zone. Uh, the interesting thing about Drone Link compared to DJI Fly is that DJI Fly <clears throat> may not even let you take off depending on where you're at. Um, it will certainly ask you to confirm that you understand the restrictions that you're in. Drone Link does not do that. Drone Link will assume that you know what you're doing and you are adhering to the laws. <clears throat> so when I take off with my drone and Drone Link, it does not question me at all. Um, I could fly illegally and it would not question me. Um, but I respect the laws. I do not want to get um, a ticket or be uh, the fact that I am posting my drone video on YouTube and on Facebook, um, that information is has all of my flight log information on it. Um, so it, it proves that I am adhering to the regulations that in the area that I'm flying. Um, it really, it really troubles me when I see people posting videos where they're 13,000 feet in the air trying to see how high they can go. Uh, that is so illegal. I don't know of any country that allows that. Um, maybe there are some, but here in the U.S., it's 400 feet. And uh, at 400 feet, uh, what are you going to see? I mean, a person is going to look like an ant. Uh, you know, a spec, uh, they're just, to me, it's just not worth getting that kind of video. Uh, you can get those kind of shots from Google Earth. Um, I, I tend to like to have good close-ups. So your only idea of um, regulations is just the height limit. There's nothing, you, you don't, because I, like, I, I, I assumed that the state of Florida um, or the county of Lake or the federal government has more requirements than just don't go over 400 feet or the lowest or stay below whatever it is for an active flight zone, you know? Well, <laughs> flying over people, is, that's a, a no-no. Uh, staying below 400 feet. Now there are some parks, uh, I'm trying to think of the one that's up by Sorrento. Um, you probably know the name of it. Um, it is marked as a, a drone fly zone. So you're allowed, uh, there's, there's markings, there's signs in the park that tell you you're allowed to fly your drone there. Um, on the converse side of that story, there are gonna be parks that are gonna have signs up that say no drone flights are allowed. However, um, airspace is controlled by the FAA. And what that's really telling you is you cannot take off from property uh, that is restricted. If you're on a public path, a public highway or a public road, and you take off from that point, you can then fly over a restricted, you know, somebody that says it's a no-fly zone. You, they cannot control the airspace. Now, they might come at you with a shotgun or something like that, thinking that they have the rights to do that, but they do not have the rights to do that. And push come to shove, uh, I think as, as Ron Waksberg has discovered, he's got a Karen that lives in his neighborhood. I call them Karens. Uh, they're, they're people that are not very nice. And, and, and they call the cops on him. And the cops come out there and they look at his paperwork and they tell the neighbor to, you know, screw off, uh, leave me alone. But he'll do it, you know, just because he's a, a hateful person. And you'll encounter those types of peoples when you go out into the public area. The kind of the thing I like about the Mavic Mini, it's 249 grams. It's lightweight. The propellers don't make a lot of noise. 
if you can go find a quiet place where there's nobody around and get airborne and get up to 100 feet, nobody's going to hear you. Um, they may see you operating your controller, but you can st you can get in your car and and fly your drone from in your car, and, and nobody will even know you're there. Um, now, I did go to uh, Howie. You probably know where Howie in the Hills is. And there's a, a little park there and a lake. And early on, before COVID became uh, so widespread, uh, there was 235 cases of COVID in Lake County at that time. <clears throat> and I went to that little park to fly with nobody around. I didn't want anyone seeing me. Yet a photographer saw me flying my drone and had to be interested in what I was doing, drove in, parked his car right where I was supposed to land, <laughs> got out with his dog and approached me within less than six feet. I had my mask with me. I was uncomfortable about it. And I went ahead, asked him to step back and landed my drone in a different area. And then he was wanting to ask 40 questions because they are interested. And out of those 40 questions come the fact that he had been positive for COVID. Oh. And, and now he was negative and donating his plasma to the hospital. And he was proud of that. But I thought, oh my, 235 people in the whole county and I encounter one, how could that be? Uh, since then, I have not gone out to those places. I've stayed here. Um, but now I got my second COVID shot. And within a couple of weeks, I will feel a little better about venturing out. Mark, your question. Thanks. My question. Go ahead, Judy. Uh, Pam, who works for the FAA, posted in chat, there is an FAA app called Before You Fly, and Correct. it will tell you if you are in a, a fly or a no-fly zone. That is correct. Uh, there's the, the other one called Air, uh, Air Data, but airmap.com will also do uh, that same feature. And... Uh, uh, I actually had that up and was going to show it. Uh, maybe I didn't get to that particular uh, section. Yeah, we saw the air one because we saw the big circles that showed around your place. Okay. Okay, Mark, go ahead. Um, so, Larry, the the uh, DJI Go app and the uh, drone link doesn't talk to each other as far as... Um, as far as communicating to each other on what it can do and what it can't do? <clears throat> well, there's a, a DJI Go app, which is uh, not for the Mavic Mini. It's the DJI Fly app that is used for it. DJI Go is used for the Inspire, the uh, Phantom, uh, you know, the upper level drones. Um, all of them, uh, regardless, do communicate with the controller. Um, so whether the whether you're using a DJI app or the drone link app, they they are communicating with the little controller that you're going to put your phone in or your tablet. Um, so, so the uh, mini doesn't use the Go Four app then. No, it uses the DJI Fly app. Okay, I didn't I wasn't aware of that. Um, so if you're flying and you had a mission plan to fly over 400 feet, DGI is not going to stop that mission plan? Say that again? If you are had a mission under Drone Link to fly over 400 feet, Drone Link, uh, DGI is not going to tell Drone Link, no, you're not going to do that? No, it will not. Because that's not the act active app. You can only have one app active at a time. Okay. So you can bring up DJI Fly, you can you can calibrate your compass, you can calibrate your IMU. Those are the two uh, calibratable features that you need to do. 
and you can set your uh, maximum return to home height and all of that stuff. And then you've got to exit that app and then open drone link. And then the mission parameters will override what you had set uh, in DJI Fly. So if you set a limit of 500 feet in drone link, it'll fly 500 feet. Okay, but once you exit drone link and go back to your DJI app, it no longer is using those parameters, correct? Correct. It'll use the parameters from DJI Fly. Okay. Well, you did a great presentation on the app. I know other people that are using the, the other app that you talked about on the Mavic Pro, um, and it does do waypoints very well. Um, but I, I liked the detail that you can do with DroneLink. So thank you. Uh, you were referring to Litchi by chance? Yes, yes. And with which drone? I don't think it supports the Mavic Mini. No, it, it, uh, it may not. Uh, we use uh, Mavic Pros and Mavic 2s. Yes, it, those are. Club. Yes, the, the, the uh, higher end drones, uh, it does support that. Yeah. So uh, I, 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 one thing I do a lot and I like doing is the Panorama and then stitching them together, the 360 by 180, and I put them out there on Google Maps. So that's kind of my thing to do um, at different locations that, that I do fly. Yes, and DroneLink has some, uh, some excellent pano tools, um, and you can create different... Uh, layers you know i think if you're doing a pano you might have uh, at least three different uh settings for your gimbal height you may be pointing up straight ahead and down or even more uh, and you can set those up uh, in drone link to take increments of you know how many degrees you want to set that up and uh, you can also create hdr uh, because the Mavic Mini doesn't have high definition resolution capability. But you can take three photos at three different uh, exposure settings and then uh, bring those into an app that merges those three together and, and allows you to adjust the light levels into a high definition resolution yeah. photo. Yeah, the Pro, the Pro, I think, has HDR, so. Yeah, but, the high-end think... drones have, have that. Yeah. Thank you, and I'll be sharing the video with uh, some of the others that fly the Mavic, so thank you. Over to you, Dwight. Question? Unmute, unmute yourself, Dwight. Thank you. I gotta push the button. <laughs> yep. <Yeah, yeah. laughs> I'm not gonna do it for you. <laughs> I got uh, the screen deck. Uh, but yeah, I've done the stair step in DJI the last couple of years. Matter of fact, three years. I started out the Spark, then I got the Air, then I got the Air 2. The Air 2 does have the new, uh, works with the uh, DJI Fly, where the other two work with the DJI Go. Uh, the maximum I've taken mine up, and it stops at 393 feet. And I know here again, you're not supposed to go four, four, uh, above 400. I basically, uh, and, and the thing I like about the Air 2 is that it does uh, use Waypoint. And I have a park about two blocks from my house, which uh, they were building over the summer, although the kids did not get a chance to use it. And I've been flying over there about once a week or so and, and getting the view of them building the uh, water park. Uh, one of the things I like about mine is basically, I also belong to a camera club and I've taken some interesting pictures from a various height and gotten some really good results and some really good scores in my camera club. Uh, as far as we were talking about 360, I like to do the 360 pan panoramic, especially in the water park where people can just slide around and view the different directions of the water park. But like I said, you want to spend a little extra money, uh, the DJI uh, Mavic Air 2 is a really good buy at this point in time. And it's one of the number one selling um, uh, drones on the market right now. Besides that, G DJI has about 70% of the market for drones. Yes, they've got a good handle on the market. I, I am impressed by the Skydio. Uh, I've watched the videos on that and that just blows me away what it can do. Um, but 
you know, for a four hundred dollar drone, <clears throat> the Mavic Mini, uh, it lets me do what I want to do, and and I don't have to invest a lot of money in it. Because when I used to fly radio control airplanes, I used to drop a, probably a thousand dollars a month uh, doing that hobby, and I'm I'm retired now, and I don't I don't have the money to put into it, so. Um, it lets me still stay in the hobby and not invest a fortune in it. Yeah, are there unless any other questions? Yeah, unless you're flying or riding a bicycle or going through a park, the Skydo is uh, not a, a drone unless you want to have it follow you. And besides that, it's not foldable. Well, I think that <clears throat> you might find that the new drone link commands that have been added, the, the follow mode, the focus mode, as well as the orbit mode, <clears throat> do give you uh, the capability to get good, or should give you, I haven't tried it, uh, but the fact is uh, the GPS in the drone and the GPS in your controller are now tied together. And the follow mode is following your controller while giving you access to the joysticks so that you can come in for a tight shot, you can go higher or lower, all the time while you're traveling. So if I wanted to get in my golf cart and drive around, or actually I would have my wife drive me around while I <laughs> flew the drone or had, had it follow me, I could get some really interesting shots. Um, but I don't think you could get those shots with Litchie. I could be mistaken, but I don't know. I think you mentioned you have the Mini 1. Yes. I think the Mini 2 is out, too. I think it has Zoom in it, which is a new feature in the AcroSync for the uh, Mavic 2 also, Mavic Air 2. That is correct. Yes. Uh, it has Zoom, which uh, <clears throat> which is a nice, plus it has 4K video. Yes. It's another $100 more, <laughs> uh, but uh, probably worth it if you're wanting to do uh, a little little better photography and still keep your price down below the $1,500 bracket. What, what did you say earlier about the max speed of a drone? They said it was 29. Um, by default, drone link sets it to 10 miles per hour and you can adjust it up or down from that. Uh, in sport mode, which if you're in the DJI Fly app, uh, you have cinematic uh, position and sports mode. So the only way you would get that kind of speed is if you were in sports mode um, or if you were using drone link where you set the speed to be, say, 25 mile per hour. But if the drone cannot reach that speed, you would probably get a mission failure, um, which is not a big deal. I mean, you can pause your mission and correct it and um, you know, refly it, but uh, sports mode is uh, especially for a beginner. You know, that that's, that's a handful. You got to know what you're doing because your mind has got to be in the drone, uh, thinking about whether left is left or left is right, depending on which way the drone is going to you or away from you. Yeah. So sports mode, you you don't have a lot of room for mistakes. Yeah, yeah and the sensors are disabled too. <laughs> yes, I, I can't stand to watch it on, on TV when they're having those drone races because I can't watch fast enough, let alone think they're controlling fast enough. <laughs> Are there, um, oh, uh, somebody asked a question uh, about the video format that's being uh, created on the drone and if there's audio and I can say that watching yours, I heard... <laughs> I could hear the propellers going, so there was some audio going with it. <laughs> uh, I have to laugh at that one. <clears throat> that is done in post-production. There is no microphone in the drone itself. Ah, you fooled me. <laughs> so I've got a helicopter sound that I use in all of my drone video. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you're not sitting there going doing this then. No. <laughs> I'm glad I fooled you, though. Yeah. All right. What uh, What's the format that's 
uh, being recorded up up in the SD card? That depends on how you've set it up in Dronely. Okay. Um, I set mine to MP4. I believe AVI and MOV are two of the other formats. Um, but I just convert them. I have MP4 files, and then uh, I bring those into YouTube. Not, not into YouTube. I bring them into Camtasia Studio, and then I I add all of the extra effects to it uh, there, and then publish it to YouTube. I think we have one time enough for one more comment question uh, from I, Kevin. I, uh Oh. I have a guy in the chat box who has some questions and he doesn't have a version that supports our raised hand. He will is, after the finish of this uh, Zoom because it'll tell him to update. I know, but he needs to ask his questions okay. now. Go ahead. Alan, unmute yourself and ask your questions and then Thank we'll you. end with Kevin. Thank you. I appreciate it. Uh, I, uh, first of all, Larry, it's a great presentation. You seem to be very knowledgeable. Uh, I've been thinking about getting one of these things, um, and so this has been very helpful to me. But I have a bunch of questions. First of all, you said it was safer to use a pre-flight uh, app uh, rather than just to go out there and do that. And so that's a little bit confusing to me because you seem to, you know, it, when you're doing it live, you you see everything around you, and why would it be why would it be more dangerous to do that? Well, if you're new to flying drones, flying a drone away from you, you you move your stick to the right to turn right. If you want to yaw to the right, you use you go to the right, and and the the drone will circle clockwise. When you get away from you, and then you turn around to come back home, your controls are reversed, and if you are not familiar, if you're not experienced. You're going to get confused and you're going to think I want to go left and you're going to push to the left and it's going to go to the right uh, or it's going to yaw counterclockwise depending on is what that easily, you're doing. Is that easily correctable right on the spot then? That wouldn't seem to be dangerous though. You might run into something. That's usually how people wreck their drone. Is really? there? Uh, yes. They, uh, they're flying, lay, say they're flying along a riverbed or something and uh, then they, they have to turn around and come back home. And, and that riverbed curves. And next thing you know, they want to go left and they go right. And they're into a tree or into the river. Uh, flying over water is another area we didn't cover. Um, and that's where those bottom sensors uh, can cause people to, to go down in the water. Um, mm -hmm. So that's another thing you got to be careful about. Uh, the reason I say it's safer to use a mission plan is you get to preview it in Google Earth and actually see what what is your, what your surroundings look like, what your what trees are around you. Now, granted, the the images there are from 1994, uh, although you can move the slider out to something later, uh, but they give you an idea that there's trees here or there's there's a water tower here, and and they give you a rough idea of what the heights are, so that you can go ahead and plan for that. And, and then your first plan that you make, you know, go well above what you think is safe. And then once you've done that initial mission, you can come back and say, okay, I I, I can really go a little bit lower here, or I can get a little tighter, a little closer there, and, and I can tweak that mission. And I can refly that same mission over and over and over and over um, to get it just the way I like it. How many hours did it take you to put together that one mission plan? That seems to be a very complicated and time-consuming task. Actually, it's it. Well, this one is kind of a um, an ac accumulation of, of different times that I've gone out there and flown. When I first started, they were just tearing the building down. So there wasn't much to see. Uh, I just went up to, uh, I think I went up to like a hundred feet and did an orbit and uh, did a very slow orbit around it. And then after that got boring, I said, well, you know, let's add a path uh, from here to there and see what that does. And then 
over time, you, you watch a lot of YouTube videos. Uh, you talk to, to people on the forums and you learn how to, to get more and more advanced with it. And, and so it just kind of uh, uh, grows over time. Uh, there are a lot of videos out there that'll help you. Typical plan, maybe an hour or more? Um, if I wanted to start that mission that's out there now from scratch, um, it may be an hour, hour and a half at, at most. Uh, knowing what I know, I mean, I know uh, how to put markers in place and um, how to change the gimbal and how to change the path. Uh, so it's just a matter of dropping the path into place and then uh, adding more waypoints and more points of interest and uh, a few more markers to change the gimbal angle and such as it flies along that path to get the shot I want. And when I, when I buy this thing, I plan on going over water. I'm glad you mentioned that because there's a pond. And, and so one of my concerns was, number one, um, would the more expensive one, would that avoid bird strikes, bird attacks, the one that with the, uh, the uh, sky, sky deal with the, the avoidance? Well, I don't know. I don't have <laughs> the. Uh, I don't have one of those drones or the uh, ability to know how well it would react. I, I know it can avoid trees and and the like, but a bird strike? I don't know. Um, there is some folks here that have been on that that has the um, the more expensive drones. Maybe. Well, they can... I don't think they will. You know, it, it comes out of the blue when the bird <laughs> comes down, so those sensors can't react that fast on a bird. Uh, as far as flying over water, you have to disable the sensor on the bottom. Otherwise, the reflection of the water will confuse the, the sensor. So I fly over water quite often, and I just disable the sensor on the bottom, and, and it's okay. You can uh, do that in the app? I do it before I take off. You do it manually by putting it like a piece of paper over it or no no it's under the dgi app that you can disable that it's in the app okay and the other the last question i have is this is these are pretty small these minis and it's easy to lose sight of these as you're flying them i presume uh, and so is it better to get a slightly larger one or what can you do to to increase your visibility can you put a light on it or something or Oh, they <laughs> they have decal sets that you can buy to, to uh, <clears throat> make them more visible. Uh, I found when I was flying radio control planes that uh, for me, yellow stood out the best uh, to identify it. The gray from this Mavic Mini is blends right in with the clouds. Um, even flying as close as I am over Publix, there are times I know where exactly where it's at. All right. So, you know, it's supposed to be. Uh, I can see it on the map. I know precisely where to look. And I'll look and squint and squint before I can see it hanging out there because uh, that gray blends in so so much. Um, so it is, yellow is a, is a good color to, to give you more background. Over to Kevin, last question. Unmute. Unmute yourself, please. Can't believe I forgot that. I like to talk so much. Uh, <laughs> how do you, how do you, when you go to a park that allows drones to be there, um, and I realize that 3D space is very big, but how do you avoid uh, both by fr physically and by frequencies of the radios uh, staying away from other drones? Oh. Uh, the software today in these controllers keeps the uh, frequencies apart. So in the old days when we flew radio control airplanes, you, you used to have a board that you put your uh, frequency marker on to keep other people from interfering you, with you. But the, the technology today is they're able to separate that in the controller. So if there's another person flying with their Mavic Mini, uh, they'll... They'll, uh, in fact, you can even see it 
uh, happening in the DJI Fly, uh, Fly app, there's a, a place that you can go to look at which Wi-Fi signal is getting interference and, and they'll show the whole range of 2.4 and 5 gigahertz. And it will, if you're on automatic, it'll switch to um, a frequency that has the least amount of interference. Okay, and is it? And I assume that the 2.4 gigahertz is, from what I've been told, is much further reaching um, in space than the five gigahertz. Have you found that, that to be the case? That, that is correct. Now, I I tried to fly from my home up to Publix through a densely populated area where there's Wi-Fi in homes, and I only got 1,400 feet before the video started it didn't go out but it was it was getting uh, interference um, you have your your video feed will go out before your controller goes out so even if you lose the get video feed you still have uh, room there to activate return to home and to manually take control uh, but if you're in a, a strong wi-fi residential area um, it, it's going to be tough to get break through all of that and go very far. Thank you. Judy, before I do my closing remarks, do you want to talk about upcoming activities? Upcoming activities. Uh, the 20, this is it, the 13th of February, we are having our virtual technology conference with six unique presentations. Uh, the end of the month is Bill James doing Wi-Fi modems and routers. And then the second Wednesday in March, we're going to be having a Mac presentation. And uh, the end of the month, it is World Backup Day on March 31st. So we will have a program about backing up with a general of why you should back up. Because I know when I ask my members to raise their hands and mm -hmm. ask how many people are backing up, they there's no eye contact, you know. They aren't, and it's so important. And then I hope to get three or four people that will give us short demonstrations on their backup program. Bob G is going to do uh, his favorite. And if you have a favorite backup program, whether it's pay or free, and you would like to give us a 15 or 20 minute demo of how easy it works for you, uh, send me an email, jtalor at apcug.org. And then in March, April, I hope to have a genealogy presentation with Gramps as an open source. And then uh, maybe mini demos on a couple of other genealogy programs. If you have any suggestions for workshops that you would like to attend, let me know. And if you would like to be like Larry did, give a presentation on something that you dearly love, uh, be on a panel like John has done, put a panel of Linux people together. You know, we can work on that together. And I mean, this is great today. I absolutely love presentations that tell a story. And Larry's told the story of drones, which was way cool. And thank you to everybody who attended. I appreciate it. And as a reminder that uh, we have recorded this and uh, I'll be passing it up to our storage box. Judy will do her little magic on it and then uh, she will be sending out the link to you only to those people who are registered. Uh, mm -hmm. We don't put it up into public until later and uh, any other in the, in the uh, presentation that, that uh, Larry did will be included and any other important comments that she sees in the chat. Judy. Actually, it only goes to those attended. Right. That's what I meant. Those attended, not registered. I'd like to thank you all on behalf of APCUG for attending our Wednesday workshops. And as always, this is a benefit of your club's membership to APCUG. This along with Speakers Bureau, news, videos, VTCs, all of that for your membership money. Well, well spent. 